my MBA clients, a lot of them have gone through depression and they have hundreds of millions of dollars. They have all the fame. One of the things I always say is, what would your 10 year old self say about your current self? Oh. And it's amazing how many of them just start like smiling or crying because they're like, my 10 year old self would be the biggest fan of my current self ever. What's up, y'all? It's Katie Austin here, and welcome back to Austin AF. Today in studio, I have Drew Hanlon coming in. He is an NBA skills coach and founder of Pure Sweat, and he has built an entire business around training NBA players, building an online business, uh, an, an app, guides, books. I mean, the guy is an entrepreneur. He's such a nice guy, and I've been trying to get him on the show ever since Austin AF started, and he does not live in LA, so this is very special he's coming into studio today we're going to talk all about motivation his drive his work ethic i kind of want to ask him some dirty details about nba players uh he trains players like joel Embiid. he uh, trains zach levine uh, jason tatum bradley beal and so i'll ask him a little juicy gossip as well so stay tuned he is about to be here but i wanted to tell y'all a really funny story because last night it was my boyfriend's birthday and it was a Tuesday night. I'm literally not 21. I have to remind myself daily that you cannot go that hard on a Tuesday night. So we're sitting there at dinner. It's like 1030 and like everyone's almost starting to leave. Becomes 11 and I'm like, well, shoot, I paid for this table. Let's just like kind of keep drinking and have fun, have a really good time. The announcer kept being like, champagne poppy coming in tonight, champagne poppy coming in tonight. And we're all like freaking out. I'm like, oh my God, oh my God. I mean, we're staying like, Drake is coming. This is crazy. So we stayed until 1 a.m. thinking that Drake is coming. Meanwhile, at about 12.50, I go over to one of the tables where the like, security is. And I'm like, is Drake coming? Like Champagne Poppy. And the guy's like, oh God, honey, his name is Champagne Pocky. Yeah, it's a real person. Champagne Pocky. I don't know. I, we, I literally made all my friends stay an extra like three hours because I told them Drake was coming, but that's not the funny story. So the funny story is all night we were sitting next to this woman who, let me tell you, work done all nines, the exact type of person you would see uh, who is causing all the drama on Real Housewives show, uh, literally a walking poster of an LA girl who marries a rich dude, okay? We're sitting next to her the entire night and she is with her fiance who is apparently very very rich and very in like the real estate world and to be honest I feel kind of naive sometimes because I always hear about like sugar daddy stuff and I always hear about like girls marrying for money but I'm never really around it or actually like to speak to someone that is actually marrying for money and it and it opened up my eyes so much last night she is coming over and she's like how old are you girls and we're like 27 and she's like Oh my God, that is so sad. Why aren't you married yet? And we were like, okay, um, what? And then she's like, because look at my ring. It is eight carats. This is the goal, ladies. This right here, doesn't matter what he looks like. I don't care. You find a man with money. This, and we looked at her ring and we're like, oh my God, it was the biggest ring that I have ever seen in my entire life. And then I asked her more questions just because it was so entertaining. She was like, I'm, no offense, she was such a joke. And I, I, I'm able to say she's such a joke because just listen. And I'm asking her questions and she's like, yeah, well, we're, we're not married yet. I, I really don't want to get married. I mean, I obviously don't love him. And we're literally like, oh my God, this girl has serious <laughs> problems. And this is actually really, really sad. She's engaged this guy, this like, he has to be like 20, 30 years older than her. She's worked on all the nines. My friend literally goes, do you have any work done yet? You look so, um, so young. Cause she was like 38, 40. And she goes, oh no, honey, I'm all natural. You should have seen these girls' lips, boobs, filler, everything was fake. It was like the funniest thing ever. So um, it was just really sad to honestly see someone in the flesh like that talking to her, saying this is the goal, the money, but I'm not in love with him whatsoever. So I kind of forget about her. We go back to eating our dinner. I go around to say hi to my other friends who were actually uh, at a table across from us. And I was just sitting there for like five minutes. As I was gone, 
Apparently, she comes up and took my seat, sat next to my boyfriend. And I didn't know this. I was at the other table, like, having fun. And she starts flirting with my boyfriend. After I told her, this is my boyfriend's birthday, this is my boyfriend. And she said, hi, to my boyfriend, as I pointed to him. Sits next to him and goes, wow, you're so fucking hot, and I will have sex with you. Um, My boyfriend's literally like, um, what? Like, literally, like, what is going on wouldn't leave the table wouldn't stop touching him stroking his leg i didn't know this i wasn't there trust me i would have said something if i was there and then she goes back to the table apparently and like because her like fiance was like staring at her comes back to lane because lane was like uh i really don't want to hook up with you lane's my boyfriend by the way i really don't want to hook up with you like please like stop talking to me she grabs his face and whispers in my boyfriend's ear I know you don't want to have sex with me now, but I will find you to fuck you before I die. Excuse me? This time I was there. So you know what I did? I go over to her table in front of her fiance, just for fun. I actually like really, I'm not like a, I'm not like a person who like actually bitches a real girl out if she's doing that. I just like kind of let it go because there's no point. But this was entertainment at this point because it was so hilarious. If you saw this girl, it was just comedy show. It was like actually watching a Bravo reality TV show at my seat at dinner at Delilah. I go over to her and I said, hi, I just want to let you know, it's kind of a bummer. My boyfriend's poor. And she goes, what are you talking about? And I was like, honey, my boyfriend's poor. Like, maybe you should be talking to someone else. And everyone was like, oh, my God. And then she comes in. She was like, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. I just thought. And I was like, I'm literally done with you. And she was trying so hard to, like, apologize to me. It was, like, the weirdest, the weirdest scenario I ever, ever, ever imagined. And I was like, wow, L.A. is full on back these girls exist. It was kind of scary to see. I'm not going to lie. Um, watch your mans out there. <laughs> um, my man is very loyal. He's fine. But I will say that was just, uh, she was a freaking character. I thought it was really funny that I literally went up to her and I was like, my boyfriend is poor. So maybe you should find someone else. He's not poor, you guys. And I just want, I just said it as a joke to her. I don't know if that was like very clear. But um, yeah, that was a really funny story. And I am excited for some more LA stories and club nights for you guys because it's fully back. And now I am having Drew Hanlon come into studio and we're going to really switch topics here. So let's do it. All right, y'all. We have Drew here in studio. Thank you so much for coming on. I'm excited to be here finally. I know. I tried to get you since the show launched on the show. So I'm very excited. Uh, He flew out to LA just to be on. No, I'm kidding. (laughs) She sent the private jet. (laughs) I I sure did. So because you went to Belmont School in Nashville, I got some Nashville hot chicken. And I'm also extremely hungover. So it's another reason that we got it. (laughs) I'm kidding. So let's bring it on over. Do you like fried chicken? I mean, everybody loves fried chicken. I know we are kind of about the hot. Okay. I'm kind of like a picky eater, but I've been expanding my range, but apparently it's really spicy. Oh great! Oh, great. oh they have oh, mild. Oh, we got mild too. Oh, oh, she's getting the hot one. This oh, one looks hot. okay. Let me see what yours is talking medium. about. Medium. Mine's medium. But wait, you are like a You're trainer. Over, so there we go. Oh my gosh! Do you want to switch? Switch. Um, are you a healthy eater though? I know we didn't. This is not that healthy. Okay, so we're lucky because so tomorrow, so eat every year I do a crazy one month like transformation, and so it starts tomorrow. So today we can pick out. So I'll do like Randy's donuts tonight. No like, way. Yeah. So we're doing like getting or getting all the crave foods. And then tomorrow we start something where like absolutely. So I'm a big believer in like 100% is easier than 98%. So like most people, they'll be like, oh, I don't really drink. But if they sometimes drink, then every night people will be like, hey, do you want to drink? And then it, then they have to make the choice of like, is tonight the night? And most of the time peer pressure, you know, just trumps the discipline. So for me, this month, I go completely no bread, no carbs, no dairy, only drink water. So last year I did it and I pick out before because I like to see like a big transformation, but I lost 25 pounds in a month. No way. In one month? 25 pounds in a month. From your diet? From diet and working out. And because you don't drink alcohol. I've never tasted alcohol in my life. Okay, I want to get to that. But I also (laughs) fully agree with you about the 98 and 100% thing because... I'm experiencing this right now with alcohol, so I really needed that. 
because I'm telling myself, okay, Katie, when you go out on, you know, a Tuesday night with your girlfriends, you can have one drink. And, you know, you can still socialize, but one leads to two, two leads to three, and all of a sudden it's 2 a.m. And I'm like, why the hell am I still here? So I gave up alcohol for 30 days, and I know you probably are like, that's nothing. No, but 30, that's big. Yeah, I know. And, it, and I actually, A, I lost a lot of weight. B, I felt so much better, and it was so much easier to just tell myself I cut it out completely instead of being like, you could just ha try for one drink. The gray area kills people. Yeah. Like, like so... I know that people always think it's weird, but so when I, one of the biggest things, when I was 12 years old, um, I started like a month long challenge. I was gonna give up sweets. So as a 12 year old, that's like that's almost impossible, huge. right? And so I did it for one month and my mom um, was like a big believer in like, hey, like if you go all in, you're gonna maximize your chances to like play college basketball. And that was always what I dreamed of playing. And so she was like, well, if you did it for a month, why don't you keep going? And wow. so at 12 years old, I gave up sweets didn't eat a sweet my entire teenage years and i the first time i had a sweet was when i was 22 after i got done playing college basketball so i went 10 years without doing that so that's why the whole people are always like why don't you drink alcohol like you've never tasted alcohol they're like you tell me like what if there's like a champagne shower you never had your mouth open and like you know alcohol came in i'm like i've literally never tasted a drop of alcohol never smoked never done anything they're like religious reasons i'm like no not at all it's just it was more so of a discipline wow. thing and then when you get to the point where if you don't drink during college at that point you're like okay i've already passed up the peer pressure but i mean it's got to the point where like um david lee who was my first ever nba client we were in vegas one time and he offered me ten thousand dollars to take a shot of alcohol oh my god and i passed it up no just way. because it was more of the principal thing of yeah. like you know what like i'm gonna stand by it so Again, not the smartest business decision of my life. And people are like, one drink won't kill you. But it's more so one of those things where, especially when I'm, I do a lot of keynote speaking and I also speak to a lot of colleges and kids. When I'm able to like tell a kid, hey, listen, like I live by the things I'm preaching. Yeah. It's a little bit nicer. It's, but it's, it also is, it is funny yeah. how many times when people offer me a drink at a club or whatever, I'll be like, no, I'm good. Or I'll be like, oh, I'll take a lemonade. They're like, okay, with what? I'm like, just, no, like just lemonade, lemonade. that's like, it. I know you want to lemonade, sweetheart, but like with what? Yeah. I'm like a virgin lemonade. Lemon. They're like, well, it's funny you because you're, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You're, you're surrounded by NBA players who love to party and you're surrounded by a lot of people who drink a lot of alcohol. And so I actually find it fascinating and, and such a good role model for these kids to not smoke and not drink and find someone that they can look up to that doesn't and not for any other reason besides discipline. But here's the other thing. I spend thousands of dollars a year on alcohol because I like people to have a good time. Oh. So my thing is I'm not one of those weirdos that's like, Oh my God, like, you know, don't drink. I'm all, I'm like low key enabling people sometimes because I'm like, if that's your thing, do it. But I just want people to like be true to who they are. Right. Does that make sense? No, totally. So like I'll go and we'll get tables and everyone's like, why are you like in a table? Cause I'm like, cause this is fun. Like every, right. some people, once they get that, like that, you know, that alcohol confidence going, they have a good vibe. We oh, I know. That. Oh, <laughs> I know. Trust me. Last I'm just night. Outgoing. I'm just outgoing as it is. So I'm you just are. like. It is what it is. So when you say you didn't have sweets, you didn't even have chocolate for 10 years. No chocolate, no ice cream, no sodas. I still haven't had a soda since I was 10 years or 12 years old. Wow. Um, so like my birthday, like, you know, normally you get a birthday cake. I would literally get like fruit and my mom would put candles because she still wanted to celebrate. But oh. it was like, again, I'm just wired a little bit different in the aspect. I'm super disciplined. I'm super like hardworking and driven. And it's it's one of those things for me is... If, if you do all those things, like you just have so much energy. Like people are like, like that's the thing that we've always talked about. Yeah. Like you have crazy amount of energy and people are always ask me like, how do you have so much energy? Like I wake up and go, go, go. It's probably because I'm not like, I'm, I keep a positive mindset, but then also I'm, I'm making sure that I, I don't have to make all these decisions over and over again. Like, am I gonna eat sweets? Am I gonna drink I alcohol? Am I gonna do this? Am I, I'm never hung over, so I'm always able to that, get up and go. I'm jealous you know? of that. I am so hung over right now. And I'm all about balance, I am, but that one month that I gave up alcohol, I had more energy than ever. I could sleep five hours a night and still be the most on focused person. My immune system was stronger. Uh, I just feel like for me, I have to like live my life a little bit. For sure. And, and you know what, to each their own, um, but I need to, take from you an example of discipline. I really do. I need to discipline myself a little bit more. If you had to say your biggest piece of advice on someone who wants to become more disciplined in whatever field they're doing, whether it's basketball training or you know whatever career, whatever relationship, alcohol, 
What is your advice? Honestly, I would just say no gray area. It's 100%. It's black and white. You either are or you're not. Like, think about how many times people will push back. Like, the word tomorrow is used so frequently, oh God, you know? Yeah. Or, <laughs> or, like, deadlines. Like, you'll, even you heard me earlier in the show, like, oh, today I can pick out because I'm starting tomorrow. And it's right. like, why not just start today? And so, um, I do some things because, like you, I think that balance is important. Another thing that I've learned, like, there were like a couple years back, one of my best friends and I are so completely different. Like I'm like work, 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 like hustle, 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 like never settle. And he's more like, I don't care how much money you make. I wouldn't want your lifestyle of always constantly on the go, always hustling, always grinding. He's yeah. like, I want to play fantasy football. I want to hang out with my friends. I want to be able to do that kind of stuff. And so what it helped me realize is I think there's too many self-help gurus that like preach like don't ever settle. and do, But I'm like, I'm more of like, you need to have bliss in your current state while pursuing something else. So I always say like blissful pursuit. So like, I think people should honestly kind of reverse engineer the life that they want to live. So if you want to go, like I, I've been getting into golf lately just because I needed like a hobby. And so now I go play golf every day and I can do that and find a little balance. But I would say the 100 is, like I said, 100 is so much easier than 98% because if you do leave yourself that yeah. little wiggle room, then it's always kind of like, oh, and if you leave it up to willpower, oh, yeah. it's just not gonna work. That 2% can easily change into 20%. For sure. Yeah. If you get in these little routines and everything becomes autopilot, so if, if things are on autopilot, you don't have to think about them. It's just, that's what you do. So like every day, if you're working out, like for you, you do all your stuff that you have to do. Um, you know, but I've even had to do things like, I have time slot on my calendar, which seems weird, but like this dedicated to like catching up with friends and family. Because I, love that. I was so bad at that. But I know if I make it like that's my most important meeting of the day, right. I know if I had a you know a cover shoot with ESPN, I wouldn't miss it. So right. why am I not, if I'm really saying like I'm all about my family, why am I not prioritizing them or my friends just like I would I some that. business endeavor? So I think you just have to put it on your schedule, make sure that you follow through. And and I'm also big on like, like if you really want to go like hardcore into making something happen, then like put like risk on it. So like mm. I'll give you an example. Um, I'm writing a book right now called Stop BSing Yourself. Shut up, you're writing a book. Yeah, so I've got goodness. two books that I'm writing. One's called Stop BSing Yourself, which is basically the art of like all the little lies that we tell ourselves. Oh yeah. All the time, you <laughs> oh, know, everybody yeah. has those. It's even like things like, um, you know, it could be losing weight. Like people like, the diet industry is a huge industry and the behind religious books, diet books are number one wow. outside of every other book category, wow. even over self-help. Now, you know this, what do you want to do if you want to get in shape? Eat better and work out. That's it. Simple. Very easy. You don't need a new diet. You don't need a new no, workout plan. You just need not. the discipline to actually follow through with those things. But people keep, you know, BSing themselves thinking a new program, a new gimmick, a new whatever is going to work. Then you think about relationships. How many people are in miserable relationships? There was a study that was done um, with Wash U and they basically asked people that were married for 30 years. They asked the man and the um, female. They basically said, if there was no money involved, so like both you guys were financially comfortable on your own, you both had the, the able to live the same way you currently live, yeah. and there were no kids involved, would you still date the person that you're married to? <gasps> what percent do you think said that both of them said they would both date? So not like, oh, we're married, so we should keep going through it. I really want to say a high number, but I feel like, what, like 50%? Two. Two percent in the study. And... The thing that was crazy what? is, now you think about it, every, I, you, like your parents have a good relationship. That's what so I you're think. Like my parents, that. I grew up with just... But if you even pulled your friends and said like, how many of your parents are still like passionate about each other? How many of your parents are still super attracted to each other? Because a lot of times people, when they're married, they end up like, I'm comfortable around this person. I oh, feel yeah. the closest person. We share a bond. We're both... I love the parent that that person is to our kids. and Or there's financial memes. We, well, we live well together. But... I mean, most of the people just become roommates. They're not passionate. They're not like, it's not like you're hooking up like you were when you yeah. were first dating. So, but 2%. And so relationships, how many people stay in bad relationships thinking something's going to change? Exactly. You're BSing yourself. So the reason I say all that is when I started writing this book, I started really researching the neuroscience behind kind of why we do and don't do things. And then also just kind of like the self-help kind of motivational side. But it's amazing how many little lies that we tell ourselves that we just allow ourselves to start believing. People are like, why aren't you in your best shape? And I'm like, I'm retired. I don't need to be in my best shape. And I've justified that to myself because in my head, I'm like, I am retired. Right. So, and I don't get paid to like be in great shape, right. but I'm like, why not be the best version of myself? It's just a, a little white lie that I told myself. And then I start getting comfortable with it over time. Okay. When you're saying all this, you, you're just so motivated. I know this is a, a little bit of a broad question again, but 
What are your best tips for other people who are listening to this to get motivated? I would say the biggest thing is find find kind of uh, like a, an opportunity for you to kind of, like I said, reverse engineer what you want most out of life. So if, if there's something where it's like a little target um, and you have – uh, you know, little wins along the way, then you're going to get motivated. You're going to have feelings of joy. True. Like, I love that. Yeah. You know, so I think that most people will say like, I want to be a millionaire. The reason that I started my training company was because I had a car that had 180,000 miles on it. It would not start if it snowed or rained the day before or was too cold just because it was really old engine. Oh my gosh. I had to get it jump started. And so I remember I went, um, I went out on a date and, you know, I was taught to like walk to the door and get the girl from the door. But I left my car running because I didn't want it to not start. I didn't want to be embarrassed. This is in high school, right? Oh my gosh. And you know, you don't really date in high school normally, but like, we were, I don't know, we were going movies or dinner <laughs> or whatever. And so I left my car and so I remember I was walking in and the dad was really happy that I didn't like honk or like, you know, call or whatever. And um, the dad's like, hey, come on in, you know. He's like, you don't have to leave your car running. And I was just like, too embarrassed. So I was like, oh no, it's all good. You know, like I just wanted to be warm or I made up some excuse. And I was like, all right, I got to get a new car. And so I went to this facility and um, I was like, hey, you know, is there anybody here that I can talk to about getting a job? It was a basketball facility. And I found out referees made 18 bucks an hour. So in high school, 18 bucks an hour is a like, lot. yeah, you're rich if you're making 18 bucks an hour. And so called him, called him, called him. He wasn't calling me back. And so I finally, I went to the facility. He was like, hey, is Matt Brobeck in? They were like, no. Knocked on his office. He wasn't there. So I opened it up for whatever reason was unlocked. I put a sticky note on his desk. was like, I know you got my messages. Call me. So he calls me. He's like, hey. He's like, why do you want this refereeing job so much? I'm like, 18 bucks an hour. I need a new car so that I don't have to get embarrassed on, you know, whatever. And he was like, uh, do you have a referee license? And I was like, no, but I promise you I can do a better job than the refs that screw me over during the games, you yeah. know? And he's like, well, you have to have like certificates. He's like, what if I pay you to be a coach for my son? And I kind of like paused and he was like, I'll give you 18 bucks an hour. I was like, done, done. Oh that's my all I gosh, wanted. yeah. So I started coaching um, this this sixth grade basketball team. And I one of the deals I made was I also got to use the facility to train myself because I was, you know, still in high school and pursuing, yeah. you know, a college scholarship. So I was training one time and a parent came over to me. It's like, I've never seen somebody work as hard as you. Can I pay you 20 bucks to train my son? So I'm like, <laughs> retired as a coach because I got a $2 pay raise. And that's how I started my training career. But it was all because I wanted this car. So... My junior in high school, I write a training book. Okay, just a basketball drill book, all the drill books. Your junior year? Junior year, so during my marketing Ooh. class, I did that. So I go to Kinko's, I convinced Kinko's that it was I needed to get them printed out for my school projects. So I got them printed out at like $5 a book. So I sold 5,000 books that summer out of my car, out of, dry, out of like backpack, like going to tournaments. What? I just dribble basketballs, do fancy drills. So I made $100,000 in, two, three months selling drill books out of the back of my car, driving around the Midwest. Oh, And that's when I was like, gosh. okay, so point is though, going back to that, the reason I did that was only because I wanted a new car. And if I didn't have that kind of, you know, goal of just getting a new car, I don't think I would have been as persistent or as been all in. And so I think what happens most of the time is people, even their jobs, they're like, all right, I want X amount of dollars, just so I can get by or just so I can live, you know, pay this much rent and this much car and whatever, instead of saying like, okay, what do I eventually want my life to be like? And then how do I build that out? And it might suck for a couple of years, but then you get to live the rest of your life however you want to. So I would say start with the end in mind, reverse engineer and kind of go backwards and then set up these little milestones so that you can appreciate the hard work paying off. Because one of the That's things, huge. when my when my MBA clients without getting into names, because I try to keep all of our relationships private, but a lot of them have gone through depression and they have hundreds of millions of dollars. They have all the fame, all the access, all everything. Whoa. And a couple of them have publicly come out and talk, spoke about their journey, but a couple of them haven't. And one of the questions I always start with, you know, I fly out there, we're sitting there and you know, there's emotional conversations and trying to help them out. One of the things I always say is, what would your 10 year old self say about your current self. Oh. And it's amazing how many of them just start like smiling or crying because they're like, my 10 year old self would be the biggest fan of my current self ever. That makes like, me you literally I mean? start like, crying. And, and you think about it, like these guys when they were 10 years old, they dreamt of playing in the NBA. And now they're in the NBA, but they don't appreciate it because again, they have that mindset of more, more, more. Wow. And I think that so many people either have the mindset of more, more, more where they can't appreciate their current situation or they have the mindset of just like, 
you know what, F it, I'm just going to settle because life has thrown me a curveball and, yeah. you know, I'm just going to stay in the batter's box and not swing. And so I think that's where people people play. They don't play in that aspect of currently, you know, like appreciating everything they totally. have. One quote that I love, my grandma used to always tell me, when I started like getting to the point where I was really getting business motivated, uh, my grandma kind of wanted me to have a little more balance. And so she told me this. She said, Drew, just remember one thing. You're never going to have everything you want, but you're always going to have more than you need. And she's like, as long as you keep that wow. kind of perspective. Yeah. Because listen, we always could have a better car, a newer house, another beach crib, another whatever. And if we always are pursuing that, we're never going to have a chance to appreciate all the blessings that we have in our life. For sure. But at the same time, our worst days, even the people out there that right now are watching this and that are depressed or that are I'm negative or, you know, that person's lucky, people are praying for their worst day. You know, like we have an orphanage in Haiti that we run and, and it's, it's when you go down, it's, that's real stress yeah, and struggle. Like totally fighting you know, every single day for their not life. having the perfect job or, you know, like oh, yeah. not being in the perfect relationship. That's not a stress or struggle. And so those people in Haiti, they pray for their next meal. They pray for water. They like, we, we complain yeah. about like water being $10 at Hyde for sure. But at least we can, while they're buy complaining it. about right. water being not healthy to drink. So wow. I just think when, when you start really thinking about that perspective and then really start appreciating all the blessings that we do have in our life, I think that's when you really kind of start, you start yeah. like stacking up wins, you know, like you have a good day and another good day and another good day. And then the perspective changes because really it's amazing how when you look at things, if you and I, we went on the same exact, you know, uh, say we went to the same place last night. Say we're both at Delilah. We <laughs> could we could have experienced the same night and had a completely different Absolutely. Out, you know, outlook totally. on how the night went based sure. on a ton of different things. And so I think when we retrain kind of our our brain to kind of find the good and and kind of appreciate all the blessings instead of constantly you know one of the things i love doing with random people too that are that are saying like when they come to me and they're like oh man i want the energy or i'm depressed or whatever i ask them real quick i'm like tell me all the bad things that happened today and they can instantly fire them off and then i'll say okay tell me all the great things and they're like um and it's hard because they've trained themselves just to find all the right. bad stuff. So Yeah, and I feel like that is a huge question that I get a lot, like, how are you so positive? And it, it's truly just focusing on the little things in life. Like, I am so happy to be sitting here with French fries in front of me. Truly, if you just switch that perspective, your entire life can change. And it doesn't matter on what what you're given. It It's all about how you react to situations. For sure. And, and think about it. Like, it doesn't matter who this person is that's listening to this. Everybody has somebody that believes in them somebody that loves them, somebody that's cheering for them, somebody that oh, sacrificed for them, and somebody that is is praying for them without them even knowing. So oh, like when you think yeah. about that, it doesn't matter how down in the dumps you are, there's somebody out there that believes in you. you and cares about you and that is secretly cheering for you. So that's why I always say it's like, I'm like, it's disrespectful to not work hard or it's disrespectful to not have fine gratitude or it's disrespectful to not live your best life because there's somebody that you don't maybe even know that person, but there's people that like are cheering for you and that are believing for you and that are secretly hoping you win. It's like, don't yeah. let that person down. Even if you don't care right now about yourself, if you don't have enough self-confidence to like do it for yourself, do it for them. Like it's so the true. Worst, you know? It's so, so true. And as you're saying all these inspiring words, I mean, so motivating. What I'm really getting across here is that when you train your NBA clients, you're also obviously an amazing trainer on the court and you teach them about, you know, shooting skills and defense and stuff, but you're a mental coach as well. For sure. Like I think I think the big thing in, in anything you do, and especially with these NBA guys, like we've got four all stars, four Olympians, like these are, you know, big time players. Right. They know how to play basketball. So I can get them incrementally better. And, and we, we always talk about an inflection point. Like, you know, if, they were, if their career was going like this, we want to have an inflection point that changes the dynamic of their career so they can kind of reach a level that they wouldn't have got there without meeting me. But cool. we know they're, they're, they're special anyway. Like they're the ones putting in the work, they're the ones getting the results. But the big thing is like most slumps on the court occur because of off the court stuff. Interesting. So. I always tell that to people because, you know, I spoke to a, a, a guy that is not one of my clients. He was really struggling this year and he had FaceTimed me out of the blue and said, hey, bro, I know I'm not one of your clients. I know we've never met before, but I'm going through a tough time. I've heard you help a lot of your guys. Uh, one of your clients recommended that I reach out. And um, he said, yeah, and he, he started speaking about the problems that were going on in his game. 
Um, and I don't want to say them because otherwise of people course. would know who yeah. it would be. And um, I instantly said, yo, life sucks right now, doesn't it? And he's, he just paused. And because he doesn't know me, he shouldn't trust me with like knowing his secrets. And I was like, I'm guessing. And I listed off some things. And he was like, bro. He just like literally, he's like, bro. He's like, I literally haven't told anyone. Like, how did you know that? I'm like, I've just done this so many times. Like, you know what I mean? And so I talk about a lot of times the 2 a.m. conversations. And when I say that, it's because when you go to, like, say I fly in town for a client, and they say, hey, my shot's messed up. Most of the time, I know their shot isn't mechanically that far off. You know, there might be little adjustments that we make. And sometimes there's nothing mechanically off. And I'll say like, oh, what are you doing with your elbow? And he's like, yeah, I feel my elbow. And we'll do it. And afterwards, you know, he'll be knocking down shots and I'll have somebody that's rebound and they'll be like, dude, you're, you're a magician. Like, how do you do that? And I'm like, nothing was wrong with this shot. I just had to make him think that something was wrong with the shot so then we could fix the fake problem. Wow. And, um, but the 2 a.m. conversations are, you're sitting there in their condo, sitting there in their crib, and they're playing video games. They're on FaceTime. You're not talking deep. You're just literally just hanging out. And then at 2 a.m., 3 a.m., sometimes 4 a.m., you just hear like them just take a deep breath and that's when all the shit's about to come out, you oh. know? And that's when, that's what they need you for, you know? And so I really do think that everyone's going through something. It doesn't matter like, it doesn't matter how positive, how motivated, how, you know, whatever. And we live our lives with these filters so it makes it even worse because, you know, I hear people all the time, they're like, that person changed. It's like, no, that person just finally took the mask off and revealed who yeah. they really are or who they really have been, you know, inside. And Absolutely. so, um, yeah, that's why I spend most of my time. That's why I've spent so much time studying the brain and, and the neuroscience and the, that kind of stuff, because I think it's just as important. Oh, or more important yeah, as you well. Have to help them as, you have to help them as players, but then you have to more importantly help them as people. And yeah. when you care about them more as people than players, that's when you build that relationship. And, and that, that trust. That they trust need to trust that, you. Yeah. And I'm not trying to say it's nice at all because that's the wrong, I think hopefully you'll understand how this is coming across, but it's nice to hear that people who are stars on the court, so famous, making $20 million a year can also have problems and more. struggles and be yeah. unhappy. And so I always try to remind like my followers too, like, hey, just because you lose 10 pounds is not gonna make you happier. Just because you're gonna get a million dollars is not gonna make you happier. It all comes from within. It's just like confidence. What I, 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 this is literally the book, Stop BSing Yourself, because most people convince themselves, if then, if then, if yeah. then. And the truth is that's not And they'll live their it. entire life that way. For sure. And it, it's just, that's, it, it's truly a mindset, everything that you're saying. I really do think, and, and again, it's funny because I mentioned one of my best friends who he was like, you know, I, he does all the things, it, him and I are so different, but it was, it was a, it was a good conversation that we had years ago because I was trying to motivate him to do all these things. And he said, Drew, I don't want those things. And I was like, at first I looked down on people that maybe didn't go all in and pursue that. And I was like, you know what? Yeah. What I changed my perspective is like, what do you really want in life? Like, what do you really want in life? And then go backwards from there. And for some people that might be, they want to just be a stay at home mom. For some people that might be a dad that yes. has time for fantasy football and yes. golfing and drinking with his boys. That's cool. And so I think that that's frowned upon too much, but it's making sure that you're living your best life and it's your best life. It's not what other people will uh, applaud you for right. because there's no <clears throat> amount of praise that'll fill you up inside. Absolutely. There's no, no amount of praise. No, and and it's so funny you say that because recently or like last year, um, some of my best friends, they just don't care to work at all. They really want to marry just like a rich guy and be like, I'm fine, whatever. And I get so mad and I'm like, come on, have some res like, respect for yourself. For sure. Like work harder, let's get up at, you know, let, let's work out. And one of my best friends, she, you know, she just doesn't work out as much, but like constantly complains about her weight. And so I get so like offended yourself, yeah. and I'm just like, come on, work harder. And then she found a place where she's okay with her weight, but she still doesn't work out. And at the same time, I'm like, looked down upon her at one point being like, well, you can work out and make yourself feel better. But at the same time, I've now changed my perspective to be like, if that's what makes her happy and she doesn't care to work out, For sure. then it's totally fine. She doesn't need to work out. That's what makes you happy, Katie. So 100%. We, to each their own. And I think that's like a great 
you know, is that really hot? The spice Yo, chicken? this medium is <laughs> I see kicking. Your eyes water. This medium is I'm kicking. Like, we're having deep conversation, and this Drew main just took a chicken. Bite. Yeah, she thinks I'm like crying. She thinks I'm getting emotional over here. I'm like, took a bite of the hot chicken. Yo, you got the spicy. Yeah, I can't wait till you eat yours. You're hungover, not, so it might I'm be. I'm not eating that. I'm, I was being bold. You I'm know, you baby. you bought this for me, so I thought I'd on camera get you going, but. Oh Golly. my god, that's funny. I feel like it's a goodbye, and I was like, oh, this is hitting. Yeah, this is hitting like, right now. Oh man, I know what I'm saying. Just mm, it hits your heart. No, I actually think that's a great place to transition, though, because I am dying to talk to you about some of your like your life and your career with this with these NBA players and the things that you see. I know we just talked so much about a deep mental health <laughs> conversation, but I just want to know, like. Is it as crazy as it seems or even crazier? Yeah, it's fun. It's fun. Like <laughs> I'll say this. I just remember when I just remember when I was in college. So I was training NBA players when I was in college. Oh, whoa. And so it was actually funny. So um I know obviously you're close with Steph as well. Mm -hmm. So David Lee was my first NBA client. And so I was, you know, around the Warriors all the time. Mm. When Steph signed his first deal, the four year, $44 million deal, which I know seems like a bargain, you know, looking at what he did during those four years. But at the time with all the ankle injuries, he was super excited. So we decided to splurge and spoil us by taking us to Cheesecake Factory of all places. Oh. <laughs> We're sitting at Cheesecake and David Lee was like, hey, Drew opens up this <laughs> the season next year at Duke. He's playing against your brother, Seth. Oh, cool. And he's like, oh, that's cool. I didn't know you coached at Belmont. And he's like, no, 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 he plays at Belmont. He's like, hold on, time out. He's like, you play college basketball. I was like, yeah. And he's like, David, why the hell are you listening to like a short white kid yeah. that plays college basketball? And David obviously was like, you know, well, Phil Jackson couldn't beat Kobe Bryant or Michael Jordan in one-on-one, -on -one, you know, I, but he could make him better. He's like, well, Drew can't beat me in one-on-one, -on -one, but he can make me better. And so that was like the first time that I was like around these, you know, kind of guys and stuff like that. I was like, okay, whatever. In college around Steph, just sitting there at dinner. Insane. Yes, but so I was like, that was mild. You know, we're at Cheesecake Factory, we're having conversations. We're like, okay, this is normal. Then like the first like New York trip and then <laughs> yeah, the first yeah, Miami yeah, trip yeah, and yeah, the first yeah. LA trip. And I'm like, <laughs> yo, like I had like seen the, like, the show Entourage and like was like, that's cool. I was like. This is real life, okay. Oh, it's crazy. I've been around uh, NBA players my entire life. If anyone listening to this, um, I, I've been around NBA players and I worked for the NBA because my dad uh, is a basketball agent. Yep. So um, I've seen a lot of shit. And obviously, mum's the word too. On, That's why I went like on, this, yeah. You, know, you can't say who ever. Also, my father would kill me. And obviously, so <laughs> also, it's not, it's not always the NBA players too. It's also the people around the NBA players because there's yes. a lot of wealthy people that want to yes. spoil or want to like show off so that they can fit in. They want to basically pay their way into being cool totally. because these, these athletes in, in, in relative to society, they're cool. They're, th they're thought of as like, oh, yeah. you know, celebrities, whatever. And so there's other people that are wealthy that don't have the celebrity status. So they try to buy their way oh, in. Oh my gosh. See uh, it all the time. I've seen guys spend $1.2 million in Vegas in one night. No, you have not. 1.2 million in one night. Okay. I've also seen people <laughs> lose millions of dollars gambling. There's been times where we've been at the table and some of my guys will play 50,000 a hand. You know, I'm over here going like, we're at the, you know, high limit table and I'm like, hey, hey, pit boss, uh, can we lower this limit for me? Like, you know, I'm gonna be playing with like a hundred to a thousand dollars a hand. What the hell? But these, some of these guys play with a bunch of money, but there's been people like next to us where, you know, I'll have a hand and I'll hit a blackjack and maybe I'm playing a thousand dollars a hand. So for me, I'm like, I just, you know, got 1500 if you hit the blackjack and I want to celebrate, but the guy before me just busted out and he lost a quarter million. And I'm like, I can't even enjoy this because this no, guy's losing. That would give me such for. high anxiety yeah. too. And that's the saddest part too. I've seen some of my dad's clients actually have no money by the time they get to 40, but they have made $80 million in their career. See, my guys are smart though. I'm gonna be honest with you. So I only work with guys that I, like, we talked about the relationship. I only work with guys that are really good people that crave improvement and because I'm gonna spend totally. so much time with them. Totally. So I don't have any guys that aren't smart with money. I don't have any guys that are assholes. You know, they treat all the interns in the gym just like they would treat, you know, the totally. you know, their head coach. So I'm not around those guys as much, but I've definitely seen as you them. have, I've seen yeah. it. I've seen guys throw money at waitresses oh, and I've seen all kinds of stuff where it's just like to me, that's disgusting as a person. Like, I wouldn't want to surround myself There's with so people like that. There's so many other ways you could spend your money, but I completely agree. And that's actually, my dad goes off of, you know, 
only working with good people. He For actually sure. doesn't really care how good you are at basketball if you're not a good person and you're not like, you know, easier to work with than some of the other guys. Like, if you look at my dad's roster, every single one right now is just like such a really caring sure. go- it dude. It has to be like that though, because yeah, it's hard to work with someone who's. If, if you're spending time around them, eventually there's going to be some collision. Absolutely. I've kicked out. I've kicked out so many NBA All Stars out of the gym and the interns or the people that work with me look at me like I'm crazy. And so they'll be like, Drew, that's another chance to blow up your resume. And I'm like, first off, my resume's fine. Like my guys have made $1.6 billion in contracts. Like they're doing okay. I don't want to have that stress in my life. And so as we talked about earlier, like I'm a big believer in just like making sure you weigh out, is this worth it? Totally. And most of the time, almost all the time, it's just not worth it. You know, the headache isn't worth it. And no. um, and yeah, like I said, I mean, good good people, or do you just want to surround yourself with as many good people as, as you can because their energy is eventually going to be part of your energy, you know? And Absolutely. so if you constantly have to carry people and, and drag them, it's going to wear you down too. I actually think it's crazy because I get asked all the time, me, I get asked for a favor of Steph to do, Steph Curry, or anyone other of my dad's clients. My father or me would never even ask one of my dad's clients for a favor. No. Ever, ever, ever. And I think it's so crazy how these entourage people or people who think that they can ask a favor of someone, it just like blows my mind of like, have you, do you not have any like integrity um, or like any, you know. You have to, you have to get really good at saying no. And, and yes. you said, what's a tip? I promise you, I say no more than anyone. Like I do. My mom always makes fun of me because she's like, Drew, you are the hardest person to get a commitment from because she'll be like, all right, Drew, hey, we're going to do dinner tomorrow night. I'll be like, perfect, I'll let you know. And she's like, Drew, can we please do dinner tomorrow night? Because then I don't have that anxiety of like, okay, I committed to something, I have to hold up to it. So it's, I just only do things that make me happy, bring joy to me and whatever. And so I think too many people though, they have trouble saying no. Yeah. And if you don't say no, if you leave that gray area of, let me see. They're going to constantly be checking in. Hey, just wanted to check in. Did you talk to Steph? Hey, checking in. Did oh, you? Oh, yeah. And then they eventually, like, if you don't make it happen, like, he didn't come through. And it's like, if, at the beginning, if you're just like, no. Totally. Then they can't say anything. It's just like, I'm, I always say it to me. I'm just like, hey, listen, I don't ask for favors of my clients, so I'm not going to ask favors of that. I just made it a, a black and you white. You have to. Black and, and white, no gray area. Yeah, no gray area. Full circle of that. Speaking of Steph, it's so crazy because um, he is truly the most humble, loyal sure. dude, family man, and you don't really see that a lot in the NBA. And I actually dated a basketball player for four and a half years and got cheated on by him, and he was just a, in college. And I've seen cheating so much, you know what I mean? And... Um, I one time was out with not one of my dad's clients, actually another guy, and he was just a friend. And I actually know his girlfriend really well. And he went home with another girl that night. And it like literally stabbed me in the heart. And I cannot be around guys like that who cheat. And it like hurts. Are you okay with like being around that environment? And how does it make you feel when you see that? I mean, it's hard to even speak on, you know what I mean? But the good news is, like I said, I have good guys and right. most of my guys now have families, which changes mm. everything. You know what I mean? Totally. Which changes everything. So they've got, most of my main clients have serious girlfriends they're, or they're married or engaged, which makes my life so much easier because I there has, early on in my career, there's been times where I had clients or even their girls will be sitting, you, you know, you sit with them at the game because, you know, they put you together and stuff. And yeah. there might be times where they'll say, oh my God, do you see so-and-so's chi- side chick? Like that player doesn't even know. And in your head, you can, you're not ratting out your client, but you're just like, sweetheart, do you not understand? Yeah. Like, <laughs> no, it hurts. Yeah, it, but it really hurts. So fortunately for me, I have good guys, so I don't have to deal with that. Totally. But early on in my career, there were some times where I was just like, Phew. you just have to take a take deep a breath, breath and, 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 and kind of play the territory. So- remove yourself a little bit and be like, well, this isn't my life and I need to stop caring about something so much when it's not my life, but someone who's been cheated on so many times by a basketball player, like when I see it, I'm just like. But here's what I'll say. This is one thing, the the only thing that I will say, a lot of guys, when you have the conversation afterwards, when they are faithful and when they are good to a girl, like my life, this is so much easier. I don't have to have three phones. I don't have to hide my stuff. I don't have to change names in my phone. Like it's, it's amazing how much stress is taken off. They're like, yeah. this is so much better. And you know what? My relationship's better. It's like, no way. Like, no, who would have ever so thought? crazy. But I really do think yeah. simplifying, like when we talked about it earlier, 
I, I think that everyone that has truly found happiness, it's they pour into a certain few things in their life instead of having themselves spread too thin. Right. And so like, if you are running around and have so much on your plate, it's just, it's hard to manage it all. And so if you just lock in on a few things that really bring you joy and happiness, yeah. then I, I feel like that's gonna bring the ultimate level of like satisfaction in your life. I completely agree. I think sometimes NBA players do cheat because they're surrounded by so many people constantly. They are have the most entertaining, uh, exciting life. But at the end of the day, they're lonely. They're traveling to how many cities? Like 30 different cities uh, a year yeah, and always sure. on the road. And I, I do think that like something comes of being lonely. And, it, and There's people, I mean, again, this is not just a basketball player thing. I think that the majority of people, they, they force themselves to be busy because they don't want to be by themselves. They're yes. not happy by themselves. So yes. it's one of those things where they, when they're by themselves, they have to think about how shitty their life is in their perspective. I've been there. Yeah, and so it, oh, yeah. it is, it's hard. And so I don't think it's just an NBA player thing. I think that's the thing that people, it's just magnified because people think, well, they have the financial capability, they have the status capability, they have the celebrity capability of to do anything they want. So like, if you can do anything you want, how could you not be happy? The problem is they don't know what they want. And that goes back to kind of reverse engineering what you because it's amazing how many people when the bubble happened and the quarantine happened, oh, yeah. they got a brief preview of what retirement life and they were going crazy. They're like, what do we do when we don't spend six hours a day playing basketball? And they got a, a preview, uh, like other people experience that all the time. Like people that work nine to five jobs, you know, there's some people that like, they'll see themselves just start scheduling dinners with people they don't even want to hang out with because they're like, yeah. I just want to do something. I don't want to go back to my condo and be lonely. I've been there. It's it's crazy because I was there before the pandemic. I so was how did you always get out? busy. Uh, lockdown. And I was there, you know, at my parents' house for three and a half months, like just every day, just like, oh my God, I can't do anything. I can't see other people. What am I going to do? And I found that my anxiety was 10 times higher when I wasn't busy and traveling, I always blamed my anxiety. Um, and you know, sometimes being upset on how busy I am, how tired I am, I'm working so hard. Then everything stopped for a few months and everything was heightened. And so I had really had to dig deep and I was so single and so lonely. I That was finally, back when you had your dating show on Instagram? I had my dating show, <laughs> had therapy, started meditating, started like doing things that didn't need validation on social media. For sure. And that can sound really broad, but truly, putting my phone down and separating real life from social media. And I now have that grasp on it so well. And I'm so happy that I can literally sit here and be like, I don't care about that life. I care about the people that I love. And so the last year for me was like the best year of my life, truly. So let me flip something on you because I, I haven't been in that place. Like I got lucky that like my mom and you know, my family is just very, very positive, like almost like annoyingly positive, <laughs> right? Um, when you were in that place and, and if somebody else was watching this and in, in that place, yeah, what would be your like big thing? Like what was your aha moment that was like, wake the F up, Katie? Like, I can't live the rest of my life like this. Or like, what was your, was it a day that you just said like flip the switch? Because sometimes you do just need to like get out of bed and say like, you know what, today's a day where I'm changing yeah. everything. Or was it more of a gradual progressive um, it change? It was gradual for sure. But I will say I... I don't really know how to say I practice gratitude, but I'm like, holy shit, I live my dream life. My entire life, I've wanted to do exactly what I'm doing and live in Los Angeles. And the fact that I can still make money doing my passion. And it, it's literally absurd. If I have any complaints ever, I'm like, whoa, look at your fucking life, Katie. It's insane. You live but, the dream. Let me take it even deeper. What happens if someone's not living their dream life? So what if they have a shitty job? Yeah. They're single and they don't want to be. They feel like, you know, they come from a family that maybe isn't supportive. And, you know, they, they feel like, oh, um, you know, I have a group of people that I can hang with, but no, like, true friends that actually care about me. Yeah, I would say, honestly, would you go there? Put, put in put in the work to change because I think change is how you are going to grow. Um, and it, I think it can be a very hard thing to realize small little differences throughout your day For can sure. really, really add up. Um, and so make the effort to find your passion, put in effort. I think being loved actually takes a lot of effort on your end and to be a giving person. Being a giving person is actually one of the most like 
uh, you know, gratifying feelings ever. So putting in work in every aspect of your life, but in small little ways. I always think consistency trumps intensity. And I think that that's what most people go all in and then they, it's like they work out so hard that mm-hmm. first day that they're too sore to work out day two yep. and day three, and then it's like gone. Yeah. You know, like my dad made a, it was pretty cool. So um, Gatorade, um, when I signed a deal with Gatorade, one of the big perks was we're gonna give you plus one to the Super Bowl. My dad's a big football fan. So I was like, all right, this is perfect. I don't yeah, care about it, budget. you know, but this is awesome. And so we we go to the Super Bowl and um, Gatorade gave us all these jackets you know, these Super Bowl jackets. And my dad, big dude, you know, um, he put on a jacket, but he couldn't zip it up. And so I said, Dad, let's start with the goal of like, you know, every day let's just portion out your meals, like half of your meals, only drink water. You know, he's like, and Budweiser. I'm like, okay, and Budweiser. Um, And then let's start walking. Like just walk until you get tired and then stop. Like that's what we'll start at. And he built it up where he started walking an hour a day. So you get like five miles a day in an hour. He lost in a calendar year, 100 pounds no way all he did was basically he took his meal so he'd take it and put half away because he realized most of the time you just eat what's in front of you i think you go to cheesecake oh, yeah. factory big food oh, yeah. you can eat it you go to these fancy places and you get this little sushi you eat it and you're still good right so it's just we eat what's in front of us so he portioned his meals and then started doing it but i basically told him never miss two days in a row so he there was an accountability thing he would text me every day his like numbers and stuff yes, like that accountability is huge and it was accountability but it was also just one of those things where if he missed i was like Start your day tomorrow where you are walking because you can't miss two days in a row. And if you never let yourself miss two days in a row, there's no way that the that. consistency isn't going to go over time. I but love that. I think most people, once they, you know, they go, they, they always think like, oh, well, a habit takes 66 days to form or 30 days. It doesn't matter how long it takes. It's how long you consistently do it. That's why so many New Year's resolutions are broken up by February. That's why so many times people stop doing the things that they started in a, in a relationship. That's why so many athletes go all in for a short duration and then they phase off. It's like you got to make it a lifestyle and you got to make it something that just is not a choice. It's the black and white thing that we talked about Absolutely. earlier. Absolutely. Drew, you are amazing. Thank you so, 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 so much for being on Austin AF. I really appreciate you. And they can find you at Drew Hanlon and at Pure Sweat. Yep. Yep. Amazing. Got it. Two for two. Okay. Thank you guys. I will see you guys next week.